back in this room. I haven't been here for a while. Um, and on a really lovely sunny day where I was saying earlier, Imperial, Imperial can look pretty when it wants to. And it's, it's managing if you stand in the right bit of the quad. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about science for people, um, which is a nice and interesting and huge topic. But I'm actually going to talk about a very specific Science for People, which was a magazine and a group of, of activists in the 1970s, which were at their moment kind of centred around Imperial. Imperial was a, a strong part of their story. Um, and learning about their story, I, bits of Imperial started to make more sense to me. So maybe when I share this story with you today, you might, it might be something that you, you, it resonates with you or it explains bits of things that you previously thought were a bit confusing. Or it might be that later in your careers at Imperial, you start to see those jigsaw puzzle pieces go together. Or maybe it's totally not meaningful to you at all, in which case I apologise. Uh, but I hope it's at least entertaining. There are also a group of people that I found profoundly entertaining and just interesting and charming human beings, even when I really disagreed with them. Um, as you can probably see from the slides, um, this is a cover of one of their magazines. Uh, they had a particular approach, they were of a particular political hue. Um, and not everyone will agree with them on that. Um, there are bits that I agree with and bits I don't agree with with what they do. They did. Um, but I think they're interesting people and I think it's worth sharing their story and being aware of this as part of the history of science. Because it is part of the history of science, um, even though I don't think it's always a bit that's told very well or recognised in our own history. Um, yeah, so Science for People. Um, it was a magazine um, active in the, in the 1970s, um, part of, run by a group called the British Society for Social Responsibility in Science, which is a horrible mouthful, um, but it allowed them to sound official. They weren't very official, they published magazines like this, um, but they, they liked to sound official. <coughs> The British Society for Social Responsibility in Science, or Bizras to its friends. So I will just say Bizras throughout this talk because it's slightly easier. Um, and yeah, they, the Bizras was founded in uh, the late 1960s, sort of between 68, 69, depending on when you exactly put a date on it. Um, these things don't sort of suddenly arrive, they gradually get discussed about and emerge. Uh, but around sort of 68, 69. And then it kind of fell apart. Again, there are different dates you could put on it, but around the late 80s. There are a few of the people involved in it who maintain they kept active right to 1990 and maybe a little bit further on, um, but there's very little evidence of them doing much. Um, the people who are involved in it are still alive, and they still take a lot of the things that they worked on through this project into their current lives. One of them ended up as Dean of the Business School here at Imperial, um, Dor Dorothy Griffiths, some of you might have encountered. She, she doesn't work here anymore, but she still has a, a strong legacy here in terms of work on women in science, and a strong legacy actually across the world in terms of work on women in science. Uh, Tom Kibble, it's another name, particularly physicist you might know, he was involved in this project, uh, in, this, in this work. Um, so they've gone on and it sort of influenced their careers and lives in sort of small and different in ways and so their work continued to have an impact but really they sort of disappeared around the late 80s and people started to forget about them. Um, and um, I had never heard of them at all um, until about two years ago where I was working at the University of Sussex and they were deciding they were, the University of Sussex had decided they were going to close a library as they do um, and they were clearing out this, this sort of science policy library um, and it was kind of sad, lots of people who'd worked at the university for years were looking through stuff and deciding what was going to go just in the bin, or well to the recyclers, and what people could take and what was going to sit in people's offices, um, what we were going to persuade the main library that they had to keep on site as part of the library. And I was just sitting working in my office um, and one of my colleagues, a reasonably elderly guy, normally what uses a stick, came and wheeled in this massive pile of magazines and just kind of left them on my desk and went, this is called Science for People. You're interested in public science stuff, aren't you? And sort of wandered off. <laughs> and I looked at this, there was this dusty pile of magazines. I thought, God, it, this is some awful student project from like 1975 and it was probably really well-meaning and kind of exciting for the people who are involved and they probably learnt a lot, but it was probably just one of those, yet another magazine where a load of people are really enthusiastic about science and want to share it with the world. And that's good, but I've seen it before. And I kind of didn't really want to have to look through it all. Because, you know, I've worked in science communication since I was 16. I've seen a lot of these things. And I was like, oh, I know it all. 
And I opened these up, and it was something completely different. It really was something that I'd never seen before, which was images like this. Uh, and you maybe can't see the detail, but um, so you've got the, the fist of justice with the word socialism, with weird flowers all the way around. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, and they, it is, it is uh, fighting through sexist, elitist, um, racist, boss, expert, and boffin. Like the expert and boffin, I wasn't necessarily expecting. But that kind of, kind of explicit statement of associating science um, with a particular political ideology very strongly, and um, also being critical of science too. And then started to worry, I sort of all these alarm bells started going off, go, oh God, this is going to be some group that like are actually homeopaths. <laughs> They weren't at all. I mean, they were people like Tom Kibble. You know, they're serious scientists. Even the ones that weren't big name scientists, even the ones that weren't trained scientists, were clearly very enthusiastic about a lot of science. They maybe didn't like boffins, and they maybe on occasion wanted to question our nature of expertise, but they did it out of a love of knowledge. In some ways, it's similar, and perhaps this group was influenced in part by similar ideology or aspects of them, as things like the evidence-based based medicine movement, which similarly kind of, at times, will critique the idea of expertise. So not necessarily the idea that someone has a body of knowledge that they can apply, but the idea that you can just sort of rest on your laurels a bit as an expert, the idea that you can go, oh, well, this person knows about something because they're an expert, as opposed to actually looking at the evidence. This group were very into scientific evidence, and when they criticised um, other bits of science, it was often because they were pointing to point out where evidence was partial, or it had been selectively... It wasn't necessarily bad evidence, but maybe people were looking in one tiny area deliberately so they didn't have to notice, like or the massive pollution over here or something. And so this is refreshing. This is a group that mixed politics and science, but don't manage to... I mean, they did in places get into all sorts of problematic bits, um, but didn't generally end up in uh, a world that rejected science um, or wasn't listening to evidence. And there was also just a lot of humour in it as well. I mean, kind of like this idea of beating up your boss. There was a... I mean, that's maybe not humorous. I don't want to condone violence. Don't go back to your labs and beat up your professors. But there was, a, um, there was an element of kind of, We'll maybe see some other pictures later. There was a strong sense of humor. And um, it also occasionally a sense of slapstick that went through it. Um, so I'll tell you a bit, a bit more about some of the, the... I'll show you some more bits of the magazine so you get a sense of the flavour of what they did, and I'll tell you a bit more about the people. Um, but to go back to the late 60s and get a sense of where they came from, this is the late 60s, for any of you that are unfamiliar with it. You may have seen, about, seen it on television. Uh, this is 1968, and this is the States. And there was a sort of wave of protest in the late 60s. Depending on which part of the world you're from, you may know a lot about this already. Um, some of you won't necessarily associate the dates of 1968 with protest either. It's not a bit of history that all countries tell about themselves. Uh, but it was an important part, it was certainly important for a lot of people who are involved in this, and it did exist in lots of different parts of the world. There was a sense for many people globally that there was a kind of global movement around different political issues. You saw an intersection of um, civil rights, particularly in the US, um, of anti-colonialist movements sort of developing um, as they had been since the war, of the anti-nuclear movement, which again had been developing since the war, and in particular a lot of work around anti-Vietnam and the anti-Vietnam war. You also started to see kind of early day 70s feminism and um, some sort of more movements in gay rights as well. They kind of grew up with more strength a bit later, but you did start to see the beginnings of that. And you also saw the beginnings of what we'd see now as the modern environmental movement. So environmental movement's got a really long history, but the kind of more modern, more science influenced, more wor starting to worry about things like climate change emerge and being organized in large scale groups uh, in the ways that you saw what are now massive uh, NGOs like Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth. They sort of have their roots in this period. And politically, you also saw a shift away from just people thinking themselves necessarily as left or right. Um, but on the left, you saw a break from what had the sort of traditional left, uh, where people looked at what was going on in the USSR and were sort of like, well, I don't want to be part of that. I want to be an anti-Stalinist left-winger. And you saw the emergence of things that were sort of called the new left which saw themselves as bringing in some of more stuff on, on anti-racism and feminism, um, and maybe thinking about the environment, uh, but also being very strong on civil liberties and 
possibly quite openly critical of some of the ways the left have gone in the past. But that's, so that's the context. But there's also a lot of people protesting. And there was a lot of people protesting about chemical and biological weapons because of the Vietnam War. And this had led to lots of students who were involved in the protest movement realising that some of this research that was being done on chemical and biological weapons was being done on their own campus. And they were quite angry about that. And in a similar way that we're now seeing divestment groups starting to do actions on climate change and then realising that there's labs or bits of work sponsored by the same organisations they're trying to stop funds going to, and maybe like at Oxford there's been protests about the Shell-sponsored um, ge ge geology department. Similar to that, you started to see activist students targeting labs on their own campus. And they'd, they did sit-ins, they took over the labs, they'd leaflet scientists on their way into the lab saying, I think what you're doing is wrong. And uh, we saw sort of this development of an anti-chemical and biological warfare movement that was starting to be around science. It was largely undergrad, maybe postgrad led, rather than professional scientists, but it was certainly kind of making itself known to scientists and involving people who might grow up to be scientists too, and sort of associating itself with the scientific community. And so some members of the scientific community who had been active on anti-nuclear stuff since the war, which there is a, a reasonably long um, history of sort of pacifist science, and particularly anti-nuclear science since the atomic bomb, um, some of them sort of thought, well, we need to have a movement around chemical and biological warfare. Um, and this is where you start to get into something like science for people. So a group in London had a meeting on sort of the ethics of chemical and biological warfare, and they had various speakers who, some of which sort of said, well, we need to do research into this, and some said they didn't, and they kind of had a conference about it. And from that, they said, well, we can build a bigger movement. We should do stuff that is science-based, that has scientific knowledge and a love of science and the kinds of expertise you have around science, um, and is also scientists being critical of themselves or critical of some of their colleagues, that makes a stand on chemical and biological warfare. We are going to be part of the anti-chemical and biological warfare movement, and we're going to do it from science, uh, and we're going to sort of articulate that. And we're going to, actually, we're going to make it bigger than chemical and biological warfare, because there's loads of things wrong with science. When they started looking at these labs, they're like, well, that's part of, a, that's part of the kind of an example of a larger problem about the way in which science, particularly post-war, had been funded, and how it had been funded by very strategic ideas in the, in, by the government and possibly also by particular industries. And so they started to look into other areas where they felt that... This, and some of them were saying, yeah, I was really narrowed, you know, when I wanted to... Fin when I finished my PhD, I had, like, five really great ideas of things I could study and I was told, well, I'm only going to get funding for this one because that one will make money for that person over there. And realising how it had, had been... There had been limits put upon them as scientists and they wanted to, to fight out about that. And they also felt... You know, they wanted to talk to the public as scientists because they love science, and yet it wasn't their job to talk to the public. And there were probably, and or they also noticed in their labs they felt that they were very sexist places, and they wanted to reform science like that. And so all these things where science isn't as good as it should be, and we want to take a stand as scientists. And so they developed into a larger movement, which they called the British Society for Social Responsibility in Science, and um, they launched a manifesto. The Buzzer's Manifesto. It was launched at the Royal Society because they had friends. I mean, these weren't just, they were, uh, they, the first meetings were just done in people's kitchens because the people organising it had kids. They were like kind of postdocs, maybe early lecturership, uh, sort of late 20s, early 30s, and some of them had children and then couldn't go out in an evening. So they just sort of like invited their friends around and the kids were running around and they were plotting this big movement. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Because a lot of them were academics, they had access to seminar rooms and they sort of became larger. And then, um, a, a Nobel Prize winner and various members of the fellows of the Royal Society started to at least kind of go, well, you, you sort of slight young-haired radicals, I'm not sure about you, but you know, I'll, I'll let you have a room at the Royal Society. Um, and they, they launched this with a, a manifesto and a sort of statement of support that was signed by all sorts of, of sort of luminaries from the scientific establishment. They themselves were trying to fight this idea that science should be led from the top from the fellows of the Royal Society down to the postdocs. They thought, well, we could have things that were led by the students or by people who aren't official members of science but love it. So the power in science should be more distributed. But they knew that it still had power associating with these big names. So they started off, I mean, kind of sort of, this is a bit of a PR stunt from them, I think. And I think it went against a lot of their values, um, which they then, several of them left as a result and had all sorts of infighting afterwards. But they started with this, this big statement of aims and this big thing signed by lots of famous people. And they started publishing a newsletter. And the main editor of that was a guy called David Dixon, who um, 
then went on to quite a big career in um, science journalism. He founded a website called SciDevNet, um, but before that he worked for Nature and for New Scientist and for Times Higher. And there's lots of science journalists across the world today um, that speak of him incredibly fondly and talk of him as a real mentor, as someone who really helped them in their career. I think he's not a name that many people would have necessarily... He didn't sort of write really famous books, so you probably haven't heard of him, David Dixon, but if you speak to science journalists, you'll often find a lot of them speaking about him very, very warmly. Um, he died a couple of years ago, which is also why they say such nice things about him, but uh, it, it's, it, they said that before while he was still alive. He was a very respected member of the science journalism community, and he cut his teeth editing this magazine. Oh, well, he, he built it from these newsletters, which, like, the first one, they just kind of wrote, a head, wrote it, hand-wrote it, and they, I, they, I interviewed people who'd been parts of this group, and they, um, last, sort of over the last year, and they talk about how they'd have to, they make this magazine. So it built into a, into a full magazine like this, um, Science for People. They built the magazine and they sort of have to lay everything out in massive rooms and um, kind of, uh, you know, you have carbon paper and type. You probably don't even know how this works. Like, um, and now when we want to put together a magazine like this, we just do it online and we've all got like a, we just like chat on Skype or whatever and we, we put it together kind of virtually and collaboratively and we have access to so many publishing tools. Uh, but for them, this was a real kind of physical struggle at times. And David and a few other people put this magazine together. Um, and this gives a sense of some of the things that they covered. So this one with petrol here, that would have been around the energy crisis in the 70s, I think. 74, maybe it's a bit early. There was certainly a, a piece on the energy crisis. Flight pollution at work, they did an awful lot of work on health and safety. And some of the people who were involved in this project, they, weren't ju they were largely about a magazine, but they did kind of work directly with people too. And they, were, they weren't the people who started citizen science movement, but they certainly gave the, the movement that we now see today as something like Zooniverse, or these big, massive projects like that, where you have public involvement in kind of doing the science. They, um, they gave that kind of field a boost. And they did it in a way that they wanted to distribute the powers and tools of science to the, pu to the public at large. And also, they felt that this would make better science because they, these people who weren't in labs, who had lives in different places and different experiences and different knowledge and expertise, might be able to access data in different ways. So they did a lot of work kind of putting tools of science into the hands of, because they were socialists, of the workers. Um, for a good example being like noise levels at work. So you, didn't use to, you go to lots of places that have high noise levels and you have to wear ear, like ear, ear, thing, ear, ear protectors to protect your ears. You didn't always used to do that. And there were lots of jobs where going deaf when you're in your 40s was just normal. It's just like your, your profession is in this field. You have to work with lots of machines and make a noise. You'll probably go a bit deaf. Um, so there'd be whole towns where lots of people worked in these industries where lots of people, when they got to a certain age, were just deaf. Um, and one of the reasons why that isn't the case anymore is that groups like Bizra's worked very hard to show that noise levels were unhealthy and that they were at unhealthy levels. This is one of the things I said. They, people, they wanted to point out that evidence base wasn't always that large, that people weren't looking in the right places. Like, so that they'd, say to some, they'd say to a company, you know, I think your noise levels are unreasonable. And they'd go, there's no evidence of that. Because you haven't looked. <laughs> like... The, the phrase absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence is often overused by all sorts of groups, particularly homeopathy people. But it is, there is a truth to it. In some contexts, it's very powerful, and this was one of them. You, know, you haven't looked. So they, what this group would do is they put um, sort of noise sensors into the hands of people who worked in these places, and they collect the data, and they'd be able to go and have a quantitative base for their fights with people like the health and safety executive. So one particular guy did a load of work showing the... Um, the differences in people who suffered health and safety at, um, problems at work and how there was a racial dimension to that because people would hire um, low-paid immigrant workforce who didn't necessarily read English that well um, for particularly precarious jobs and they wouldn't see the set health and safety information and so this, uh, people kind of knew that, but they didn't, uh, no one had really studied it. And one of the business people did an actual quantitative study of it and then could give the data to the health and safety executive. And in, that's why, in lots of contexts, you'll see health and safety information in multiple languages. Because they made and changed the law because they got the data together and could say, look, we're scientists, we're going to crunch the data and do that. So that picture there reflects a whole body of work they did, which often was actually out and about and doing things and making things and being part of scientific work, make, well, kind of an alternative body of scientific work. This is another this is an illustration from one of the magazines, really reflects a big key thing that they were worried about, which was the idea that scientists were kind of being 
manipulated by particular industries. Now, at times, they were kind of claiming that, like, oh, scientists are just, like, big oil shills and things. But often it was more subtle than that. And I think this is something that people will recognise today. And it's more that... It's not that the science that some... If science is funded by the drug industry or the military or something, it's not necessarily bad science, but it's looking in a very particular place. And that all the different things that the scientists could be studying were limited to just the things that were going to make money for very particular industries. And then we weren't looking at all sorts of other things. So we do... You know, we'll do a lot of studies on turbines, but we won't spend a lot. We won't spend as much money as we could on like studying the oceans or something. And so I think that's what that reflected. Although it varied, and there were different people in different who were attracted to this group at different times, and some of them they had all sorts of different agendas, and all sorts of different experiences themselves in and out of science. And they also did a lot of anti-military stuff and anti-weapons at home. So the period in the 1970s where um, Britain. I mean, it depends on who you talk to about how you describe it. When I grew up, we were told it was the Troubles, um, which is the, start of the, the sort of protest in Northern Ireland, um, and Sinn Féin and, and groups who wanted independence for the whole of Ireland. And we were just known as, it, as the Troubles. Some other people would have called it outright civil war, and certainly something that I never really appreciated growing up, even though I grew up in the Irish area of London, um, was quite how much force was used on the people who are protesting in Northern Ireland. So when we have controversies around rubber bullets or tear gas or water cannon today, rubber bullets in, uh, in particular were invented to, to work in Northern Ireland. They used water cannon loads. These used to do stuff where they'd use... The water they'd use in the water cannon would be dyed a particular colour. So anyone hit by it, their clothes would be dyed. And that would mean that if they then went into work or to talk to their family, they were kind of marked. It was a way of marking people. And it could create kind of social shame. Uh, but also, it would be very expensive to clean the clothes or replace them. And these were often very poor people who couldn't afford to do that. So you'd create a sort of financial burden on the protesters as well. Um, sort of very sneaky stuff. Um, and they, so this group, Bizra's, uh, campaigned on that. And for all that they were, these uh, kind of left-wing radicals in many ways, they did try and play their scientific credibility in a sense that they were... The, the British Society for Social Responsibility and Science. It's all very apolitical. Um, and so they'd make friends with all sorts of people. And the Daily Telegraph actually sent them on a fact-finding mission to Northern Ireland to look at uh, uh, tear gas, I mean. which is not something that... You don't imagine the Daily Telegraph sending a load of socialists off on a fact-finding mission, but they did because they were scientists and they, they thought they had something to add. And the particular work they did, which isn't necessarily reflected in these images, but it was a really important body of work that they did, was in Northern Ireland... Um, Looking, it was a guy called Tim Chalice who ended up being in quite high up as a neurologist at UCL. You might know him if you know much about neurology. Um, and he, um, he's a fellow of the Royal Society now. And back in the 70s, he was just interested in these issues um, and thought, well, I've read the science. It's not my particular area, but I know enough about the science around it to be able to critically assess this more than a normal person off the street. And the particular topic he was looking at was... Um, ways of interrogating suspects. So Britain uh, had kind of refined what we can now explicitly call torture, which at the time they called in-depth interrogation. Um, there was the five methods. If you Google it, it's quite dark what the five methods was. Um, but it was sort of, you were hooding people in darkness uh, so they couldn't see. You'd uh, stop them from being able to... You'd have temperature changes, you make them stand up against the wall, you just kind of make them incredib incredibly uncomfortable, and then you interrogate them. Um, these were methods that were first developed um, in Malaysia in the colonial sort of pro anti colonial protest that Britain was involved in, and then sort of refined in Northern Ireland. And we then sold to countries around the world. You'll see bits of them pop up in the kind of CIA files that came out last year. But uh, what uh, Chalice did was he, he really looked at this and went, no, we've got evidence to say that it doesn't work and also that it causes a huge, a really profound psychological damage to the people you're, you're doing, and this is torture. And we've got evidence to say that this is torture and that you know it is torture. And you're saying it's you know, interrogation methods, but we know it's torture. And they eventually took uh, Britain to the European Court of Human Rights and they got you know, told off for, for torturing their, their citizens. Um, which is why we can call it that now. Um, but he was, he was key in that, and that's a really good way of showing how they linked in with other campaigns to bring the scientific expertise through. 
Uh, another big thing they did was women in science. This is from one of their women in science things. So you've got, this is what they were saying women in science were in the 70s. Something to be looked at, the male gaze, but, but added with some scientific um, sort of extra vig rigor, <laughs> I don't know, where you put them in a tube and look at them and study them. Um, they had this, this was from the women's collective issue on, of the magazine, which I think really is a brilliant description of what we call the leaky pipe problem in science, which is when you have loads of women go into science, or a fair number, depends on the field. But in like, biology, loads of women go science. Even in like, physics and engineering, you've got a fair number, and then they just sort of fall out. You don't, they don't get to the very top. And this happens in lots of fields. It's not just science, but it's particularly obvious in science, uh, partly just to do with at the point of when you're going to be, as I'm sure you all know, points in which you're going to be asked to maybe move country or take particularly short-term contracts or work very long hours, which might overlap with when a lot of women are thinking about having children. Um, but there's all sorts of other reasons why they would sort of fall through the leaky pipe too. But this has it snakes and ladders. So you have the women and the man, and the, the, the little girl and the boy, both keen on signs starting out. And as they go up, women has got various things that stop her from, from getting there. Or lots of, it could be outright sexism. It could be because they want to take some time off to have a kid. Um, whereas the man is just sort of blithely, very keenly walking up the, the ladders. And, you know, seems like just this keen, very bright person. And the woman never gets to be able to see themselves as that. So at the top then you have the Nobel Prize winner actually with a, with a mallet kind of hitting down. <laughs> uh, but it's a brilliant depiction of uh, women in science. It still kind of resonates. Oh. Um, uh, just to finish up, I want to say that they weren't the only group doing this. This is the American version, which apart from being... Um, well, you can see the iconography. You've got Lenin and uh, Marx there. It's much more explicitly wearing its left wing on its, on its sleeve. Um, it was much more radical. I think they were much more left-wing and much more radically left-wing and much more revolutionary left-wing than the, um, than the Bizarre's people, who were you know, of the left but of a mix. Uh, but this lot were, were very much far left and proud and quite angry with the Brits. They'd, have, they'd be like, you, just, you're like you'd ha you'd, you can kind of get away with being a socialist in Britain in a way that you can't in the States. So you just kind of sit there and hang out with everyone else and it's like normal and then you don't have the big action. Whereas in America, we're, we, have, we suffer because we get uh, isolated and we are going to fight. And they seem to think that they were going to, that this was better. I mean, whether you think one or the other is better is up to you. You might think they're both ridiculous, but this was the argument they had between them. And the other thing that's noticeable about this is there you were signs for the people, not signs for people. And apparently, uh, the Brits decided they couldn't be signs for the people because that was too revolutionary and that would scare people. I don't know why signs for people is less revolutionary, but apparently it is. Um, but you can see, if you Google these groups, um, some of the Science for People magazines are online and you can look at uh, so online versions of them, and, and some of the Science for the People are too. Um, so why did they end? Well, they ended in the 80s. This is another illustration from one of the later magazines, and it reflects one of the reasons they ended. I talked to quite a few of them over the summer about you know, their time in business and why they think it fell apart and why they left it and stuff. And there's lots of different reasons, but... They, a lot of them coalesce about the fact that there was, a big, there was a bit of a political change in the 80s. And so some of them, if they were social activists, found themselves fighting all sorts of other things. They were fighting privatisation and the cuts to the public sector. Um, they were working in health and dealing with people who had all sorts of health problems because of these cuts. Um, and some of them also were saying, well, they kind of wanted to give up because they spent the 70s fighting what, for what they said were the people. And then the people voted in Thatcher. And they were like, well, you weren't on my side. And some of them were angry about this, like the, the people voted for Thatcher. Some of them were like, well, maybe I was wrong, you know? And some of them moved in. Uh, one of the guys involved ended up working for Tony Blair and um, sort of being part of the New Labour project, which is a very different idea of sort of change in what the left was. And others kind of moved more to the left. And the, or others, others just went back into their science. Well, like, kind of political and other bits of their lives, but... Um, you know, they just focused. Well, part of them they just grew up. You know, they got older. They had other things to do, and so part of that was their jobs. Um, but Thatcher's interesting here, not just because she was part of this group that was, she was, you know, head of the government of this a very different political era, but she was a scientist, and she was revolutionary in her politics. Uh, she arguably changed British society in many, many ways. So the the um, the. 70s radicals I looked at, they thought that science was going to change the world. They thought that them as scientists could be at the forefront of a social revolution. And they felt that they should revolutionise science. And meanwhile, 
This other scientist was getting ready to revolutionise the world and arguably revolutionise science as well because she put into changes in how universities run and how science is funded. And she just did it, you know, she was the one that was successful anyway. Whether you think that was good or not, again, is up to you. But that's their story. Um, and I would recommend that you Google them and find out more because they are part of our history. And they're part of Imperial's history too. Thank you very much. Can we take some questions? Yeah, sure. So first of all, I remember the 60s. <laughs> and... I remember on TV when people were advertising toothpaste and things like that, they would always have scientists in white coats saying this is a good thing, and, and scientists had a lot of credibility on television. So there's this interesting conflict here between you know, nuclear weapons and biological weapons and selling toothpaste in terms of how the people view scientists. Yeah, there's, there's interesting... It's hard to study whether, how the public attitude to science changed over that time because although we've got some great recent data on public attitude to science, it doesn't necessarily go that far back. But there is an excellent study, again done partly through Imperial um, and the Science Museum, which is a British press over from the, the 50s to the 90s. And um, they show that the British press were generally very... They really loved science and took it as sort of a great, an unquestionably great thing. And then around the 70s, it kind of fell. Yeah. And then it grew again, though, interestingly. And I think that this Bizros group sort of were part of that wave. Yeah, I think I still sometimes see people in white coats on television. Well, yeah, and Thatcher did campaign in a white coat. Um, oh, yeah. that I didn't know. We take some questions from the floor? If I may, uh, you talk exclusively about the past. One of the legacy wastes of Mrs. Thatcher was the fact that Today, it would be extremely difficult for shopkeepers to go to Oxford without accumulating massive debts. And with a uh, student debt program, will fairly be privatized with future conservative administrations. And with school fees being, being increased to the largest possible extent, right, left, and center, uh, doesn't this endanger scientific development in Britain? Because already when I applied to Imperial College, I was warned many times that I need not apply unless I can finance myself. And on the other hand, I had to satisfy an entry condition so ridiculously low that three quarters of my former colleagues were satisfied. So when selection really becomes the best of those who can afford us instead of the best of those that are, you have a severely detrimental effect that essentially transfer, transforms a university into an engine of elitist self-perpetuation. Yeah, I would agree that we're in danger. One of the reasons I thought I'm no longer as an academic was I felt I was working as part of an engine of inequality, and I didn't want to be part of that anymore. I still have hope that universities aren't entirely that, and that they can reform and change and, uh, and be more than that. And I think they still are more than that, but it was one of the reasons I left. I have sympathy with that argument. Um, but I would, I mean, to, to talk about this group, one of the other th knock-on effects of that is that talking to them about whether they thought a similar group might emerge today, they said that they don't think that working scientists have the time or the job security to be able to do that. They felt that back in the 70s, they often did, but now um, you're worried about um, debt, or at the least, or you know, you're much more worried about pleasing your colleagues because your contract might only be for a very short period of time and it needs renewing. Um, and so there is a way in which, even if you get that far in, which, as you say, is increasingly difficult, um, you, um, there, the, you know, there isn't the space for having this kind of political action, which could be not just necessarily in terms of this framing of politics. It could be people doing all sorts of different activities. It could have been some of the more recent stuff we've had on you know, standing up for science, all that kind of work that gets done um, today. People maybe have less space for, which would be mm. sad, I think. In terms of the order in which the hands went up, this gentleman and then that gentleman over there. Um, so one of the criticisms I saw in one of the snippets in the earlier slides was they were really critical of this idea of big science. So one of the questions I have for you is like, what do you think about modern big science? Like organizations like CERN, can they not be used as actually a tool for, you know, changing all these social issues forward? Like for example, we now have like a first female director of CERN and uh, maybe it's easier to enact some of these changes if you have these institutions or changes coming from the top because it's such a wide organization rather than trying to affect change in small scattered groups throughout different universities. Like, don't you think that big science can kind of lead the way in some sense in having these kind of issues? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think one of the reasons, my personal view is that 
but big science can be brilliant. Like it's an expression of lots of people collecting together to do something amazing. And I think that people who is a, people who are of a uh, socialist bent could see that as being very inspirational in terms of the way they see the world too. But um, this particular group, I think one of the reasons why they weren't all, they, I'd certainly say that some of them still talking today, I think some of them would be very pro big science and probably at the time a lot of them were very pro big science. It was who got to run the big science. And it was the, the kind of big science that had grown up post war off the back of the atomic bomb and the Manhattan Project in particular had been ones that served particular interests. So CERN, CERN is interesting because it's, it was set up partly, well, it's set up for lots of reasons, but it was, and it was allowed to exist for lots of reasons. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily sit in that place, which is obviously a, a project of the military or of um, the oil industry, although there are ways in which it may well serve all sorts of different interests, but it's not, you know, it's not kind of being led by that, in that way that you had that sort of scientist kind of looking like they were being pulled by that. Um, and I think a lot of them might see inspiration in CERN. But, uh, yeah, I mean, my personal view is it can be great, but equally... It can isolate the individual a bit, which could lead to some of the other problems there. Mm. It's not a simple good or bad. But if, mm. on this group, they're probably, overall, they weren't all anti-big science. Let's take that question. Um, so I, we saw in your first slide that the, the, this group was very anti-experts um, as kind of knowledge. I've also heard that they had, they had more radical ideas about the philosophy of science as well, like uh, scientific fact as a social construct. Have you heard that? And oh, so some of them did, and there were fights within the group, actually. So this is a, this is a whole... If I write a book about this, it would be a whole chapter. And um, there was one particular guy who um, was... I mean, they, they saw... So what, whether they see a fact as socially constructed, this is sometimes misunderstood. Just because something is socially constructed doesn't mean it's not real. This building was built by society, but it's solid. You know, you kick it, you'll hurt your toe. It creates something that is real. And it, can, it works within the boundaries of physical reality. Um, to say something is, is made by people doesn't necessarily mean it's not real. But sometimes the arguments that surround the idea of social constructivism are to say, oh, we just made this up. We can make up something else. And so there are kind of bits, there's degrees within those sorts of arguments around that, where you have extreme relativism, which sort of says, well, anyone's idea is the same as anyone else's, and other ones which are a bit more strongly sort of ideas of, well, this is a fact. And most of the business people wanted to say, well, there's a kind of fact out there, but us as humans are a bit rubbish, so we haven't necessarily got there yet, and we need to unpack how we're rubbish. And we need to unpack how society impinges on our ability to see reality. So some of the things that we might take as fact, we might decide are actually a bit sexist or a bit racist. But we don't know that yet. But that doesn't mean that they're not necessarily true, or, they're not any, or it doesn't mean that they're not truer than just someone on the street making something up. And there were, there were lots of fights within that. So the, particularly this guy, Bob Young, who many people claimed was a relativist. And people still claim he's a relativist. If you Google him, you'll see lots of people having fights with him. He himself would claim he wasn't. But that's often the case with these people. Um, and there was a big fight throughout the 70s between Bob Young and Tim Chalice, who's the guy who did all the stuff um, in Northern Ireland, where Tim Chalice was much more of the kind of traditional realist scientist. And Bob was like, well, you're a scientist. You can't see your ideology. And Tim was like, well, you're not a scientist. You can't see, what, you know, you can't see reality, uh, which is often the way in which these fights go. So they had, there was a spectrum there. And there were, talking to them now, today, you could have asked them to think back on what was good and bad about <coughs> it. And a few of them said, well, we had a couple of people that were just terrible social constructivists. And I think that was a, a reason why often groups like this have fallen out in the past, because there's differences of opinion there. And it's not a simple thing of being social constructivist or realist. There's always degrees in the middle. And that's the point where people have the fight. OK, I think we'll stop there, because I've got a few housekeeping comments. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <clears throat>